Merry Christmas, you guys. And we're outside. It's a California kind of Christmas. We can just interact a little bit. It's great to be with you guys tonight. And we want to welcome you here tonight. And those of you that are at home watching online, we want to welcome you as well. We are blessed to be able to celebrate the wonderful gift of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we are truly blessed that it really is the most wonderful time of the year, a time to celebrate the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for those that have gathered tonight. And now as we go into your word, I pray that your word would speak to us and speak to us in power. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You heard the song with Adam and I, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Now, that may seem challenging to say in the midst of our pandemic. Here in Orange County, with rising COVID cases, this week, 800,000 new people on unemployment, not to mention the unexpected wonderful rain that hit 30 minutes before our Christmas Eve service. Truly, I can say 2020 has been an un unprecedented kind of year. Now, starting out this way, some of you might be saying, wait a second, Chad, I brought a friend. Um, I thought you were going to be a little bit more encouraging, a little bit more inspiring. We know what happened to us this year. Well, that's the point. It's the point of me mentioning these things because oftentimes we forget why it's the most wonderful time of the year. You see, it's not just kids jingle belling and everyone telling to be of good cheer. It's not just parties for hosting and marshmallows toasting. No, it's about a story a long, long time ago told well, all the way back to 800 years to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, he tells of Jesus Christ, his name will be called Wonderful. That's why it's the most wonderful time of the year. Because this year, we, this time of year, we celebrate Jesus. And whether it's Christmas Day or any day of the year, any day with Jesus is the most wonderful time of the year. Now listen to what Isaiah said of him. His name will be called Wonderful. Now, stop there for just a minute, because I know his name. You might be thinking, oh, a title, but that's not the Hebrew understanding of a name. You see, when I say Chet, and that's my title, that's my name, you also think of my reputation. What does Chet mean to you? I have a uh, friend in high school, and I'm sorry if your name is uh, Brianna, but uh, my wife wanted to name one of our children Brianna. And soon as she said Brianna, I kind of curled because Brianna in high school was not a very friendly girl to me. She had a reputation that I couldn't imagine naming one of my children and then remembering her in high school as she ridiculed me almost every single day. Because a name is not just a title. No, a name is a reputation. It talks about as if Isaiah is saying, here's what Jesus will be known for. That's what Isaiah is saying. Now, I'm amazed how wonderful it is that God would reveal his plan 800 years before Christ would even come. But he says, here's what he's going to be known for. He's going to be known to be filled with wonder. Now, as I described the Hebrew word name, I need to describe the Hebrew word wonder. You see, this word means extraordinary, amazing. People will be amazed. It means miraculous. And if you could indulge me for a moment, I'm going to relate this word to Christmas cookies. I lo- In fact... It was only yesterday that Adam Brown's mother, Patty Brown, she made Christmas cookies for Adam and Adam lovingly shared with me. And when he gave me this cookie, I bit it. And all I could taste was butter and chocolate 
and caramel and a little sprinkle of salt and something crunchy. I don't know what it was, but when I bit into it, the thing that came out of my mouth was, this is wonderful. This is extraordinary. This is, in fact, I love all Christmas cookies. I don't know if you were here this past Sunday, but I was talking about this one pound chocolate chip cookies. Well, someone in our body drew, drove all the way to San Diego, bought me a dozen of them and put them on my front door. I had almost 12 pounds of chocolate chip cookie at my front door. I've gone through eight of them because they're so Wonderful. You see extraordinary? No, this word actually means a little bit more than just a Christmas cookie that's wonderful. This Hebrew word, wonderful, it means doing things that can't be done. It means accomplishing the impossible. It's like Gabriel telling Mary nothing will be impossible for God. That's what the angel Gabriel told Mary when she said, how can these things be? He says, nothing's going to be impossible with God. That's what Gabriel said, because his name is wonderful. He can do the unimaginable. He can do the impossible. He is wonderful wonderful. That's what he's going to be known for. Well, this season, Christmas time, we're celebrating his birth because his birth was wonderful. I want you to hear the story for just a minute. An angel shows up to a virgin. Her name is Mary and says to a virgin, she's never known a man. You're going to be pregnant. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. I want you to hear this story for the very first time. Imagine what Mary was thinking. Me? Are you kidding? This is unbelievable. Here he goes. His name is wonderful. He can do the unbelievable. And then a star. Oh, not Jupiter and Saturn coming together. No, no, no. Not the Christmas star we saw just a couple of days ago. No, no, no. A star would rise in the east. And there would be magi over in the land of Babylon. They would see this star. And see, I know it's not the Christmas star we saw a couple of days ago because this star would lead them for two years, not just one night. And it was there guiding and directing and leading them to the exact place that Mary and Joseph were. How wonderful is that? Seems impossible. Just imagine Angels were showing up and giving people messages from God and God was giving Joseph dreams, directing and leading him in his dream. How wonderful is that? Think of the angels. And if you could, for just a moment, I want the lights above of the building up here and all of these lights here and all of these lights there. I want you to imagine that all of them are angels that just showed up in the parking lot at Coast Hills Church. Just be the shepherds for just a minute. And all of a sudden the sky lights up and all of these lights, even more than these, a multitude says glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Can you imagine if that happened in this parking lot tonight? That is absolutely wonderful. Or what about the strategy? The strategy of God for Jesus to come born of a virgin. See, let me explain. It's a perfect strategy. It's a perfect strategy to escape Roman persecution. For the story was going around, it was the time. The king of kings and the Lord of lords and surely the Romans were looking for this child and as Mary was passing from Roman checkpoint to Roman checkpoint, Jesus was protected in the womb of Mary. And then he would be born. Born in a sheep pen, placed in a manger, he was affording no threat to the Roman government or the Roman guards. Our king of kings, by strategy of God, would be perfectly safe in his humble abode. And then, that night, 
unannounced, unknown shepherds would show up because they would tell Mary and Joseph, angels told us that you were here and a babe would be wrapped in swaddling clothes. This is an unbelievable story because his name is wonderful. And it makes perfect sense to me that when Mary was telling Luke this story, Luke would look at her and write, Mary treasured, she treasured this story in her heart. You see, his birth was wonderful, but his life was wonderful. So wonderful was his life. He developed such a reputation of how wonderful he was that John would say in John 21, 25, that if I was to write all the wonderful things that Jesus did while he was on earth, the earth could not contain the volume of books that would be written. Oh, he did wonderful thing after wonderful thing. Do you remember when the disciples were terrified for their lives on the Sea of Galilee? There was a storm. And Jesus, he was up on the hill. He was praying for them. And then in the midst of the storm, he would walk on the water and he'd bring them peace. I've experienced that myself in the midst of my own storms. Or what of the centurion? The centurion had a need, a real need. His servant was sick and he was dying. And he knew that Jesus could meet that need. So he went to Jesus in prayer and he says, I need your help. Jesus responds by commending the faith of the centurion and then meeting his need. Or what of the wonderful work of the woman? She was sick for 12 years and much like even today, she had spent all of her money on medicine. And when she would reach out and touch Jesus, Jesus would not only heal her body, Jesus would heal her soul. He would meet her where she was at. Oh, Jesus, you are so wonderful. So wonderful that your enemies absolutely despised all of the wonderful things that you did. Listen, he was so wonderful, Matthew chapter 21, but when the chief priest saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They were mad. They were angry. Well, this happened to me just a couple of days ago. I walked into a store, and as I'm leaving, Merry Christmas. The guy responded, Happy Holidays. And I responded, Merry Christmas. And he responded, Happy Holidays. And I said, Christmas is about Jesus. And Christ, Mas, Mas is Spanish, means more, more of Christ. Merry Christmas. He had nothing else to say. You see, people are mad at Jesus. They don't want to hear that he walked on water. And maybe you're mad tonight because your mom said to you, all I want for Christmas is for you to come to church. So you just came mad and angry because you wanted to give your mom her gift that she asked for. Well, I love Jesus because he ain't mad at you. And when the Pharisees were indignant and they said, you need to stop them, Jesus only responded with scripture and he said, out of the mouth of babes, perfects praise. He wasn't mad at them. He was trying to reach them. He's trying to reach you right now. He's not mad at you. He's not out to get you. In fact, you're not here by accident or simply because your mom asked you to come. No, you're here by appointment so that I can tell you how great and wonderful Jesus is. He's so wonderful. And his words are so wonderful. The people marveled over his words at the first century and even today. Let me give you an example. The golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto. Look who knows it. 2,000 years later, the golden rule is still having its impact. That's the words of Jesus. They're absolutely wonderful. When he says things like it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, we've all felt that feeling at Christmas when we get that wow gift for our kids and they get so excited about what you're giving them and you feel so good inside. 
You see, the words of Jesus, whether they were 2,000 years ago or they are today, the Bible says that they're living and they're active. They're so wonderful that when you read your Bible, you're not reading a book. You're actually having a conversation with God. His word? His word is wonder-filled. You remember When the Pharisees were jeering him, he responds and he says, before Abraham, I am. Let me tell you how wonderful that is. You see, he reveals in his word, his eternal existence. His word, that's what he's known as, the word of God. He spoke the world into existence to reveal his power. He led the Israelites through the wilderness. You remember? It was a pillar of fire at night, much like the fires around this parking lot to keep them warm. It was a cloud over them in the heat of the day so that they would stay cool. He wasn't mad at the Israelites for rejecting him. He was trying to win them over by his grace and his mercy and love. It was there in a fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Daniel in the lion's den, he would show up and he would be with them. Of course he would. He's Emmanuel, God with us. So wanting to be with us all through the Old Testament, he would appear for a moment. He was with Abraham. He wrestled with Jacob. He led Joshua's army as the captain of the army of hosts. And then Christmas morning, Emmanuel, he would be with us. His word tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's all we read about him in the Old Testament. All we read about him in the New Testament is only to there to explain to us who he is for us today. Paul would say that he's before all things and with him all things can consist. Can you imagine the world without Jesus in the midst of COVID? If you think the world is unraveling, just imagine if he wasn't holding it together, what it would look like. His word is wonderful. Gang, his death, his death was wonderful. You see, he told the disciples that if he's lifted up on that cross, if he's lifted up, he was going to draw all people to himself. You see, God used the cross to expose Jesus to the world. And I want you to see at the wonderful impact the cross has had on the entire world. Jesus wasn't guilty of anything. He was tried by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court. He was tried by the Roman court with Pilate. He was tried by King Herod and all three found him absolutely not guilty because his death was so wonderful, he didn't die for himself or anything that he did wrong. He died for our sin because he was without sin. He paid our price so that we wouldn't have to die and be separated from God. How wonderful is that? And the proof that he didn't die for himself and that he died for us, you remember on the cross, he sits and he looks at his enemies and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's Jesus. He's so wonderful, even in his death, He would pray for his enemies. He would look at his mom. And there on the cross, he's beaten, he's bruised, and he's bleeding. He would look at his mom and say, John, I want you to take care of my mom. Because he was dying for everyone else but himself. Because Jesus showed us what love is. And he would say in John 15, greater love has no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. And Jesus showed us how great a love he has for us. How wonderful is that? You see, he said that he would be the resurrection. He said that he would be the life. He told his disciples and he rose from the grave three days later. Now, if Jesus can do what he said he would do by rising from the dead, what's impossible for him, even in the midst of COVID? The truth is, he can make all things new. 
even your life tonight. I dare any one of you to name something that's too hard for God when God says his name is wonderful. Since he is the life, and since through him all things consist, is it possible that 2020 is actually a plan for our lives? Maybe this year is about us redefining what we thought was wonderful and redefining it with who is wonderful. Maybe our lockdown was just an opportunity for us to spend a little bit more time in prayer. And I know some, in fact, I know many who've experienced loss, whether the loss of a job or the loss of a loved one, but they found how wonderful Jesus is, is the God of all comfort and Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Maybe it's possible that 2020 disrupted our routine because Jesus, who is so wonderful, wants us to have a new way and a new way to do life in him. Listen to what the prophet told the nation of Israel. Look among the nations and watch. Look at Italy. Look at Brazil. Look at London. Look at the United States of America. How appropriate is this word for us today? Be utterly astounded. I want you to be filled with wonder with what I'm about to do. For I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe though it were told you. Who would have thought that COVID would come in 2020? But is it possible that God is doing a great work? And is the church woke to how wonderful Jesus is? You see, he is wonderful. He's wonderful for us today. Not just in the life he lived for the disciples. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as he prayed for the disciples, he intercedes for us. And as he had grace for those that were around him, as he healed, as he ministered, he still has grace for us us today, still wants to heal us today, still wants to minister to us today. Listen to what the hymn writer wrote. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul, friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my savior, makes me whole. Hallelujah, what a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He's with me to the end. Jesus, what a strength and weakness. Let me hide myself in him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing. He, my strength, my victory wins. Jesus, what a help in sorrow. While the billows over me roll, even when my heart is breaking, he, my comfort, helps my soul. Hallelujah, the hymn writer proclaims. What a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving, he is with me to the end. You might think I'm done. But I, like the psalmist, will continue to declare how wonderful and continue to proclaim how wonderful are his works. Because church, there's a hope beyond our current experience. Because his wonders, his wonders stretch into eternity. You see, church, there's going to be a wonderful day when the dead in Christ will rise and those of us who are alive will meet Jesus in the air. It's called the rapture of the church. It's hope for us. You see, the church, the church is going to be spared from the great and awesome wonders of the wrath of God because he's going to purify a world that's been polluted with sin. And the church... The church will return at the end of that seven-year tribulation with Jesus Christ and the clouds are going to roll back and the Lord Jesus is going to descend and we, the church, will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Hallelujah! What a Savior! Hallelujah! What a friend! That's our Savior. And church, His name is is wonderful. So what I want to do this Christmas, my prayer is that you would set your mind on things above. 
Let your heart worship his wonder as Mary did. When the angel told her that she was a virgin, that she was going to have a child, she in wonder-filled worship, she looked at the angel and she said, how can this be? And Gabriel, Gabriel told her, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And the power of God. Now I need to give you Gabriel's perspective if I can for just a moment. Do you remember Zechariah when he doubted that Elizabeth would get pregnant? In Luke chapter 1 verse 19, Gabriel says, I'm Gabriel, dude. I stand in the presence of God and I've come to bring you glad tidings. I'm not talking about a theologian who read a bunch of commentaries and is going to try to explain to you the incredible power and the wonderfulness of God. No, he says, I'm Gabriel. <laughs> I've seen God. I've seen him act. And Mary, I got to tell you something. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you because God would never ask you to do something that he won't give you the power to do. So if God has promised you peace, he'll give it to you by the power of the Spirit. If he's promised faith, then you don't have to live in fear. And if you don't think you can do what he's asking you to do, he can give you the courage by the power of his Holy Spirit. And even in the year of COVID, he has said, let your light so shine. Church, that's a message for us. Because just like the fires that you see burning around you, the darker it gets, the brighter they'll shine. And no matter your perspective, wherever you see a fire, it can't hide. It's going to show itself. Because that's what light does. Now, God wouldn't tell you, let your light shine, and then you couldn't do it. He says, let your light so shine, and then gives you the power of the Holy Spirit, just like he told Mary, the Spirit is going to do it. And he's going to do it in you. Now, for those of you who don't know how wonderful he is, and you're the one that came kicking and screaming, I want you to remember it was Jesus that had a pillar of fire at night in the desert for the Israelites who rebelled against him to keep them warm. It was Jesus that had a cloud over them by day to keep them cool. He loved them. And the truth is he loves you. Hebrews chapter two, listen, verse one. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard lest we drift away. For if the words spoken through angels prove steadfast, in other words, if it was true, Jesus really did raise from the dead, and every transgression and obedience received, disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness with both signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Gang, I, I, I got to say something. Tonight you've heard of the wonders of Jesus. So officially tonight you're without excuse. Why would you neglect so great a salvation when he can deliver you from the dark cloud that you're living in and bring you into wonder-filled light. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm so thankful. So thankful for your word. And I'm so grateful that in you alone, we can be in awe. No matter what our experience is, no matter our circumstance, your name is wonderful. So we praise you. We give you the glory.